Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. 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 Standing. And so you may have seen on the video some shuffling around and some moving of stuff as we get started here. I swear to God, I tested this yesterday. And with the camera and the computer placed where it was, the camera saw the whole whiteboard. Um, but now I just had to move it like three feet so that it could see most of the whiteboard. So I don't know. I'll experiment more later, but not during class. Um, this is a, oh wait, question though, there's stuff written on the whiteboard. Is it mirrored for you or is it just mirrored for me? It's normal for us. Perfect. That's what I thought was going to happen. Yeah. It's hard for me to test without using two computers. And when the camera was closer to the whiteboard, it didn't keep changing focus. So I'll, I'll figure that out as we go. Probably by the last lecture of the term, there will be no technical difficulties. <laughs> so we could, we could only hope. Um, you guys are here for ME 1800, I assume? Outstanding. You can see that the Canvas site is beautiful and fully formed. Wait, no. It has one piece of information, the link for this class. Okay, I'll, I'll get that sorted out today. Um, and, and we'll talk more about that later. I'm just going <laughs> to see um, how many people we got. We got 61 people on the 70 some register for the class. So I'm just going to go ahead and start. Um, Doug, Doug Moore, your job it says you have your video turned on and you appear right next to me in the view of, uh, of the thing here. Your job is to make sure that if I seem to be talking about stuff on the whiteboard, that you guys can see the whiteboard. And if I seem to be talking about stuff on a PowerPoint slide, you guys can see the PowerPoint slide. Please unmute yourself and interrupt me if it seems like I'm talking about the whiteboard and I'm showing a PowerPoint slide, or it seems like I'm talking about the PowerPoint slide and I'm showing the whiteboard. Uh, that's your job today, Doug. All right. I have, let's see if I remember any of these Zoom controls, share screen, this one. Share. Now you guys should see my, well, it's actually not PowerPoint, it's Google Slides, but whatever. You should see my Google Slides PowerPoint slide. Is that true? Yep. Outstanding. Was that Doug? Yes. Perfect. My plan works. Sometime, sometime later during the class, remind me to tell you the story about why this lecture happens at eight o'clock in the morning. But um, right now, I'd like you to, uh, to, to bear with me for just a second. Now, I know that this is an engineering class. And I know that for many of you, it's your first engineering class. And, and don't worry, throughout the class, we are going to engineer the shit out of this stuff. And, and before we're done, we're going to do plenty of math and we're going to spend plenty of time talking about science. But, but before we get to that, I want you to indulge me for just a second. You see, I aspire one day to be a high school history teacher. And, and in addition to that, when I, when I took this job, I realized that teaching, that I realized that I liked teaching. And I decided that I wanted to become good at teaching. And so I started researching about learning and teaching and how teaching works. I actually, I went down a path where I studied marketing, the science of marketing and how that relates to teaching and, uh, and, and went so far as to study brainwashing techniques. These are not the drone, the droids you're looking for. Um, but uh, so, I know that if you can associate emotion with something, you remember it better. And I will endeavor to not get too far afield throughout the class, 
but I'll also tell you some stories about things that may help you put some emotion next to the facts so that you remember them longer than just long enough to take the test. So I'd like you to close your eyes if you could. And, um, and I'd like you to remember, travel back in time with me. Now, most of you could probably go back like 15, 20 years. And I realized last night that that means you don't remember 9-11. But that's okay. I don't remember the Kennedy assassination. I don't remember either of them. Now, I do remember the day the space shuttle blew up both times. I remember the day Reagan was shot. And, and as a true Cold War kid, I was certain that the commies were going to invade. But, but keep your eyes closed and let's go back even further than that. Let's go back to my grandparents' time. Maybe that's even your great-grandparents' time. And I, I want to tell you a story. It was February 19th, 1942. The RP Resort carrying 78,729 barrels of crude oil left Houston, Texas, bound for Fall River, Massachusetts. Ten days into her voyage, just off the coast of New Jersey, she was struck by a torpedo on her port side. Now, in addition to the 442 thousand cubic feet of crude oil she carried 41 crew two more torpedoes struck her one lifeboat launched two souls in the water when the coast guard finally arrived they found one man in the lifeboat one body in the water by the 1940s by 1940 hitler's germany occupied almost all of the european continent the british were his most significant competitor in the west and of course the russians in the east the brits had a significant problem that the russians didn't have though they lived on an island and they relied on shipping to supply their industry, particularly their defense industries. In 1931, in 1939, German U-boats sank 114 merchant ships bound for England. They put 400,000 tons of materials on the bottom of the ocean. In 1940, it was 225 ships and 2.6 million tons. The situation was untenable to say the least. And although the U.S. wasn't officially at war until late 1941, you better believe that our merchant marine fleet was fully engaged beginning since the beginning. These the German U-boat commanders were sinking anything not flying a German flag, including passenger liners heading west. But, you know, the situation was indeed untenable, and the Allies, if the Allies couldn't find a way to fix it, they were going to be screwed. There was a war on. People were dying. The U-boats basically controlled the seas. What could they do? You know, the obvious answer was protect the merchant ships. You know, send out naval vessels, try to kill the U-boats. And the Brits did this. In 1940, though, they were only able to send escorts 300 miles from their shore. It's about a 2,000-mile crossing. And they had to keep the, the boats close to shore because they were worried about things like invasion. Um, in, uh, when the U.S. did finally join the war, you know, we were able to send out escort ships with the convoys. And, and if there's a movie about that that came out this summer. Um, you may have seen it. It's Greyhound. Tom Hanks stars in it. If you haven't seen it, you should watch that movie. But uh, so, so we were able to send out escort ships. But, uh, but that is not how we solved the problem with the U-boats. The way we solved the problem with the U-boats was by overwhelming them with targets. Between 1940 and 1945, U.S. shipyards built and launched almost 6,000 vessels. In the 10 years before that, it's likely that they built about two dozen ships. By 1943, we were launching a ship every eight hours, some of them being built in just four days. In the same five years, we manufactured 300,000 aircraft, 190,000 artillery pieces, about 90,000 tanks and billions of rounds of ammunition. It was manufacturing that gave the 16.5 million US troops who fought alongside our allies the tools that they needed to ensure that you can travel anywhere in Europe today speaking only English. It's why you don't have to speak German before you can study science and engineering. It's because of manufacturing that, man, that, that the man in the high castle is indeed fiction and not reality TV. You guys can open your eyes again. It was dangerous having to close your eyes just after you woke up, wasn't it? Anybody, anybody nod off? Anybody? Bueller? Um, oh, I can advance my PowerPoint slide now.
Oh, no, I got to be in the right. There we go. Advance my PowerPoint slide. So, so I state. Ooh, that's loud. I state that manufacturing is what won World War II. It couldn't have won World War II without the troops, obviously, but it certainly was significant. Um, this class, as you know, is about manufacturing. It's about CNC machining, prototype manufacturing. I, I, I like to refer to the class as the introduction to the manufacturing. And if we're going to talk about manufacturing for the entire term, right now I'd, I'd like you guys, can, can you all open up the chat window? Even if you don't have your video on, you can open up the chat window. And I, I'd like you to type in the chat window what you think manufacturing is. So you, you all took a class with manufacturing in the title. So I hope you all have an opinion about what the title means. So go ahead in the chat, go ahead and type what you think it is. I'll figure out how I can view the chat again. It's down here. When I do the screen sharing, Zoom moves where the controls are. It's really annoying. I think if I do control alt shift, it changes the There's my Zoom, my controls. Now I can open up the chat window. All right, only 13 people have posted in the chat here, so more of you need to respond. Otherwise, I'm going to think you fell asleep. All right. <laughs> All right, I got, I got after insert loud snoring noises here. I wanted to make a joke because uh, as an aside, I use an app to, to try it off. Sleep and, uh, and it records my snoring. And I snored for one hour last night out of the six hours I was asleep. <clears throat> um, but, uh, but Nick says that it's fabrication of a product. Fabrication of a product. Production of something, some machine product in the same way over and over again. Mass creation of goods, large scale production of refined goods, the process of turning designs into reality. Um, let me write some of these down. Let me turn off the screen share. It, and so now I think if you, if you double click on me, it'll show up as being the big. Um, you can see the whiteboard okay? Yep. This one out of focus. My problem is I can't see the chat when I'm all the way over here at the whiteboard. So could somebody, oh, and autofocus is really a yeah, thing. Still not in focus. There we go. You guys all see the whiteboard? All right, okay, perfect. Yeah. Somebody shout out to me what the chat says. What is manufacturing? I, I remember fabrication. After fabrication Mass of a product. Production. I think I turned the volume all the way down so I can't hear you guys when you shout out. Oh. Next oh, item shouting out to me. Next item on the list is mass creation of goods. So mass creation, followed by large scale production of refined goods. Large scale production. Followed by the process of turning designs into reality. Turning design, turn design into All right, fabrication, mass production, mass creation, large scale production, turning designs into reality. What else, what else jumps out at you? Oh, jumps out? I was just reading every item on oh, the list. Oh, you can read them all. Just t t now tell me the ones that jump out at you. We got the first few. The processing of raw materials. Processing. Goods for sale. Hit making, production, 
Processing raw materials. Mm, making more complex items and structure from simpler ones. Making complex things. And process, making, creation. Is creation on there? Uh, we got mass creation, but we don't have creation. Okay. I like creation in the beginning. There's the process of taking an idea, whether that be drawing or CAD design, and going through a fabrication process to create the final part. Although I think that's all right. Con Ooh. Concept. Through process. Efficiently producing effective parts and products. Efficient. Production. Use of machines to make products. Anything else jumps out at you right now? Um, there's, oh, getting products off the assembly line as efficiently and cost effective as possible. So efficient assembly line. Interpreting, creation. Did we ever work on an assembly line? You could raise your hand at the participant thing if you have. Uh, Anybody here ever work on an assembly line? Yeah, I've never worked on an assembly line, but I have worked in manufacturing. Okay, I think I think we pretty much covered what I believe showed up in the chat. Yeah. Do we see any common trends in our answers to what is manufacturing? I see we talk about creation. Talk about creation. We talk about Production, products, fabrication. In uh, when we talk about manufacturing, and one of the things we'll do in the class is we'll uh, we'll get into these sort of buzzwords of of the industry. When we talk about manufacturing, we we will learn that there's a difference between fabrication and production. Um, well, fabrication is really a subset of production. But um, we've got to so fabrication, production, product, processing, taking to so changing. So those are all sort of making things, right? Those, that part of the definition, that's about making. So one of the things that, that manufacturing requires is it requires making. But the red whiteboard marker does not write. Now I'm using a green one. If you're red, green, colorblind, you don't know the difference anyway. So making is important in manufacturing. What else is important in manufacturing besides making? I think there's a couple of people touched on so from simple things and raw materials. So you're making something out of something, right? So there's an input that goes into the box that's called manufacturing. And there's an output that comes out of the box that is the product of manufacturing. So we're making raw materials into products. What makes something a product? People want to buy it. Products are things people want to buy. So manufacturing, if manufacturing is making products, and we use raw materials when we do it, and we use processes when we do it, 
If manufacturing is making products, then manufacturing is making stuff people want. Would you, would you agree with that? Can we settle on that for a definition? Do you guys agree? Thumbs up? Thumbs down? You people with no video on, it's hard for me to tell the position of your thumb, you know. You could be doing anything with that thumb right now. All right, screen share. Back. By the end of this, I will have figured out the Zoom control. Screen share. Manufacturing is making stuff people want. Share. All right, now you guys can see the, uh, the PowerPoint thing, right? Looks good. Manufacturing makes stuff people want. You know they want it when they pay for it. Before they pay for it, you only think that maybe they might kind of want it. You have a belief, perhaps. You have faith. But you don't know they want it until they pay for it. They're not actually a customer until they've bought something from you. So that's, uh, that's also something to keep in mind as we talk about manufacturing. Um, I wrote on the board here, and I know I've got a PowerPoint up that I'm talking about the board. But did anybody take a look at the, the questions and answers that I wrote on the side of the board? Does anybody remember what they were? Nope. Okay, that's fair. I didn't tell you that there'd be a quiz on that. But uh, get out your paper and pencils. And no, sorry, no quiz. <coughs> Let me read them off to you. So I said that, uh, that when we do this lecture, the things that I want you to think about, questions I think you should be able to answer when we're done with this, are what is manufacturing and what is making? What's the difference between the two of them? I think we understand that making is a part of manufacturing. But you could make stuff. Somebody looks like they're in the kitchen making breakfast. Ron, are you making breakfast? Yeah. What are you making? I'm uh, making some sausage. Woo! Fancy. I'm making some uh, cinnamon toast. One time in D term, I heard a toilet flush when I was doing a lecture. I don't know if that was just a sound effect to tell me that I was speaking out of the wrong orifice or. Uh, if, uh, if somebody was in the bathroom. But I, I also heard a recording of when the Supreme Court was hearing arguments and, uh, and one of the justices was apparently uh, flushing the toilet during the arguments too. So don't feel bad if it happens to you. It could happen to anyone. And, and just so you know, I am wearing pants. Because you wouldn't know unless I showed you. All right, so the question to answer is, what is manufacturing? What is making? What is the difference between the two? I think we can all do that now. We're going to talk in a few minutes about why manufacturing is important to society. And basically, this is my sales pitch to you about why you should care about finishing this class. Um, we're going to talk about the engineer's role in manufacturing. We're going to talk about the scientist's role in manufacturing. But we're also going to hopefully determine why you should listen to me when I talk about manufacturing. Because if, if you don't believe me when I talk about manufacturing, then it is just a bunch of hot air and it has no value. So what are some reasons that you should listen to me when I talk about manufacturing? All right, there will be quizzes and tests. I make the quizzes and tests. So I try to talk about the things that I expect will be on the quizzes and tests. Some of you care about your grade, right? I wasn't one of those college students that cared about the grade. I mean, I did care about not getting kicked out. And, and I did eventually finish. And actually, you guys know I was WPI. I, I am a WPI alumni. In fact, I got three degrees from WPI. I got a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. Yeah, that took a while. It took me, yeah. Year six, I kind of buckled down and I got to work. The second semester of year six, I took six classes each term. All right, five classes plus MQB. I also got all A's. 
that second semester. And that's the only semester I got all A's. Um, I had learned how to finish, but it took me until my sixth year in WPI to learn how to finish. Um, I've got a, a master's degree from WPI that I, that I got in manufacturing engineering. And, and that was an accident. I actually wanted to get a master's degree in electrical engineering from WPI. I came here, I applied for the electrical engineering program, and it was Professor Luft who reviewed my application and, and he told me that, well, your undergraduate degree is mechanical engineering. You can't get a graduate degree in electrical engineering. I mean, you have to take eight undergraduate courses in electrical engineering before we'd even consider your application. Or go to, go to UMass, they'll accept you. And, and that day I walked into uh, Professor Brown's office and he was had a manufacturing program at the time and he had been my advisor when I was here as a student. And he says, well, hey, I have TA credits I could give you if you want to do manufacturing engineering. And I said, yeah, sign me up, free school. So I got my master's degree and that was in 2000. So that was 20 years ago. It took those 20 years for me to get my PhD. I spent 20 years then doing the research that got me my PhD, which I got. This year, I didn't get to walk in graduation because there wasn't no graduation. Did you guys know that? Um, they mailed it to me. They mailed, there's supposed to be a whole big ceremony where your advisor puts the hood on you and, you, and everybody shakes your hand and there's wine and cheese. They mailed it to me. <sighs> I should wear it when I teach. That'd be fun. Um, so, so, all right, so, so I've, I've studied manufacturing. I did that. Um, my, uh, my, my wife and I actually own a manufacturing company. We operate a manufacturing company and we operate a software company. The software is about selling manufacturing stuff. So it's all in manufacturing. Um, this, this teaching gig I have at WPI, this is my retirement job. I retired in 1997. And then I learned about manufacturing. So I don't know if you should listen to me or not, but I am passionate about it. I believe that manufacturing is the most important industry in the world. And I believe that if we understand how to do manufacturing, then we can generate new wealth. There's two, there's two schools of thought about value and wealth. There, there, there are the people who believe that there's a limited amount of wealth out there and I gotta go get me some. And every bit of it that I get, I take away from somebody else. And there's the people that believe that. And, and they're really good at taking it, by the way. But if that is true, th th those people that are really good at taking wealth, they're really good at doing deals, then those people get all of it and it all rises to the top. And there's nothing left for you and me down here. So there's, there's, there's that school of thought. But if you understand that wealth has no limit and that we can create new wealth, then we, then, then everybody can succeed, right? Everybody, the, the whole harbor rises, right? The whole harbor rises, all the ships go up, except for the ones that get struck by two torpedoes, three torpedoes by Russian U-boats. So, all right, so, <clears throat> I think I know something about manufacturing. I think you should listen to me about it and you'll have to judge that as we go along. So why should you listen to me about manufacturing? Um, is there anybody in this, in this class on accident? Unmute yourself and speak up. Anybody that didn't mean to sign up for this class? No? All right, so our, our, our first assignment in the class it is going to be for you to make a video of yourself, selfie video, a video of yourself. I'll set up a discussion forum thread where you can post your video, but a video of yourself explaining why you took the class, but more than just that, what do you intend to learn in this class? And so it's more an assignment for you to focus your thoughts on the class. So it's make a selfie video, why you take the class and what do you intend to learn? And, uh, and, and I'll put up a discussion forum thread where you can post that. Uh, and I'll, I'll put up the, the rest of the syllabus and all the grading criteria and stuff like that. 
and, and we can we can talk about that in, in a future lecture if you have questions about it. Um, there are some of you that are remote, fully remote doing the class, and there are most of you that are on campus doing the class. For those of you that are on campus during the class, we are gonna have labs. Labs are going to start next week. The lab is not open this week, so you can't even come by and visit because we're still not ready for the labs to start next week. We still have machine tools to move and things to do to get ready so that you guys can be socially distant while, uh, while you're doing your labs. However, you've got, each of you has a two hour time block that shows up on your schedule for lab. You will have lab during that two hour time block. Normally what we do in those labs is everybody comes in and sits down. We have 18 computers, we have 18 people in a lab. You all sit down at your computer and then we bring you out one at a time to go use one of the machine tools to do the machining part of the lab. And while you're at your computer, you work on the programming part of the lab. And so normally that's how we do it. We can't jam you all into that little space with the 18 computers anymore because of the, uh, the post COVID environment that we're living in. Cause you know, this is all going to go away last April when it warms up. But, um, so instead of that, each one of you will be assigned a 35 minute window during that two hour window to be in the lab, be standing in front of a machine tool, doing an exercise that requires you to be standing in front of the machine tool. At the beginning of your 35 minute interval, you have to be there. And at the end of it, you have to walk away because the next person is gonna start. And, and so that's how, so everybody's gonna have about an hour a week standing in front of a machine tool doing machining exercises, but we're still gonna do the computer part of the labs. It's just that we're gonna do those, and you can do those at your own pace with the exception of you still have to hand them in on time. Um, and we're going to have pretty much all day long, five days of the week, somebody on call monitoring a discussion forum. So if you're working on the computer exercise and you have a question about it, you post in the discussion forum, hey, I'm working on this, I have a question about this. If the person just knows the answer and they can easily type the answer, they'll just type the reply to you. They'll be on call at the moment when you post. More likely though, it'll be a little bit more complicated than that. And they're gonna say, here's a link for a Zoom, jump on the Zoom with me and I will step you through it or I will take control of your computer and show you how to do it and then you can do it again. And, and so they'll be monitoring that all day. So you can do it during your scheduled lab time or you can do it whenever you want to. Um, uh, we'll have people staffing that from roughly nine in the morning till nine in the evening. Um, all right, so that's labs. Your schedule shows lecture on Tuesday, lecture on Thursday, conference on Wednesday. And they're all at the same time in the same room. I don't know why they call the Wednesday one a conference. It's really three lectures. There's no difference between Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, except as we get closer to the end of the term, we're gonna stop doing the Wednesdays. So we'll have about three weeks of Monday, uh, so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then after three weeks, we will only use the Wednesdays if something comes up and we need to spend more time on a topic, which I hope gives you more time to focus on the lab content of the class or more time to focus on some other class that you're working on. All right, so 8.30. Does anybody, so and I'll, I'll post all this in the syllabus and this is being recorded. Normally these, uh, these Zooms will be live on YouTube as well as uh, being a Zoom, but you should participate in the Zoom, not the YouTube live because it's, it's harder to interact on the YouTube live because I'm not looking at that chat. I'm looking at this chat and, and I want you guys to interrupt, interact with me. Um, feel free to speak. I, I know at least one of you is in a room where somebody else is also taking a class because I can see somebody in the background with their headphones on too. So uh, I, I see two of you actually next to each other on the screen doing that. So. I get it. Sometimes it's it's difficult to speak. I actually like the Zoom format because we have the chat window too, and uh, and sometimes people who are uh, less likely to speak might might join in the chat instead. So my next question. All right. So 
The first question was, what is manufacturing? And I've talked a little bit about myself and my passion for this. This is way better than D-Term was, by the way. Because in D-Term, I was doing this from my kitchen. And I had a little tiny postcard size whiteboard behind me. And I had, oh, and it was also at lunchtime. So my kids would be cooking lunch for themselves while I was doing the lecture. At least now I get to be at WPI sort of in a classroom. I would do it from my office, but there's a construction site right outside my office. You may have walked by it. And, uh, and usually about this time of day, they're dumping stuff out of dump trucks right outside my windows. So that's loud. All right. So manufacturing is making stuff that people want. Am I screen sharing? I think I am, right? Okay. Yeah, you've got, you've still got the same slide up. Stuff people want. So if manufacturing is making stuff people want, turn off the screen share for a second. Could one person be a manufacturer? I would say yes. Right. One person could be a manufacturer. A crafts person. So there, there are plenty of manufacturers selling their goods on Etsy. Right? <clears throat> yes. Somebody raised their hand. Right. Yeah. What do you got? Um, there are a lot of people who seem to have the same issue that I have. I had to look back at my schedule over this. Um, both on Course Planner and now on Bannerweb and everything. Um, looking through my schedule, and a lot of people seem to have the same issue. We don't have anything recorded for ME 1800 on Wednesday. Are we going to have lecture on Wednesday morning? There's always been three classes. I didn't check Bannerweb because it's always been that way. You certain you don't have anything on Wednesday? I'll work it out with the registrar. Oh, yeah, okay. I can pull up my um page. Uh, I, 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 I believe you. Okay. Um, I'll I will follow up offline and, and figure that out. But I've been teaching this class since 2006, and it has always met on Wednesday. I've been told the registrar can be a mess from time to time. <laughs> uh, but if if it's not on your schedule, we'll figure out a different way to do the content. Um, <clears throat> and like I said, I only use about half of the Wednesdays anyway, so we'll figure that out, and I'll adjust my schedule if, if the registrar didn't put it down for you, and we may do some of that content asynchronously. All right. Um, I don't have a... Oh, sorry, go on. Say again? I don't have a time conflict, so I can easily be here Wednesday morning. Yeah, well, maybe we'll figure that out. Um, I, I actually would rather do this at 11 in the morning instead of at 8 in the morning. Agreed. Um, and we don't live in the Western um, time zone. People that can make it get to be there, and the people that can't make it get to uh, get to watch the video. Um. <laughs> the reason, oh, 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 I promised to tell you the reason that this is at eight o'clock and not at eleven o'clock. I wanted to use the fancy new classroom in Boise, the one where I get to walk around and there's projectors pointing at all four walls and you guys get these standing desks where you can form little groups and you can work on little group projects together. And the only way I could get that classroom was agreeing to teach at eight o'clock in the morning. And so I said, yeah, I'll do it. I'll get up. I used to, I used to love eight o'clock classes. Um, sophomore year, sophomore year at WPI. In the winter, I had an eight, nine, 10 o'clock class. By 11 o'clock, my car was at the ski area. Every day, I didn't get a job at the ski area. I was a ski instructor. So every morning at 11 o'clock, my car with the bumper sticker that said, my parents think I'm in college, was parked in the front row right up against the slopes. <laughs> Maybe that's why it took six years to finish. I did my homework on the chairlift. I would like, I would have like, Printouts of stuff, and I would read it as I went up the chairlift. I was on snow every day between Christmas and April that year. No misses. Um, so yeah, I wanted to teach in that fancy classroom, and that's why we have eight o'clock lecture. 
but I'm sure that's why the schedule is screwed up. Um, we'll fix that. Manufacturing and banking stuff people want, you know they want it because they pay for it. So we have manufacturers, we have customers, which means manufacturing entails making stuff because you gotta have stuff and it entails selling stuff, right? So even if you're a solo manufacturer working by yourself, you're still a business. Is that fair? You can't do manufacturing. You can do making. A, a good friend of mine makes a lot of stuff, but he never sells it. So he's a maker, but he's not a manufacturer. And you can do all of the same kinds of, you can use the same tools. You can do the same kind of work, making and manufacturing. It becomes manufacturing when you're doing it with the intent of selling. So if manufacturing is a business, what goes into operating a manufacturing business, do you think? What are the things we have to have? Uh, please shout them out. I'm not going to be looking at the screen. What do we have to have if we want to create a manufacturing business? Uh, materials. We need raw materials. Mm. Tools. Lean machines. And that business is plan. You need machines. Financial support. We need um, machines. Tools. Here. You're going to need um, some kind of space to do, uh, to like actually produce your parts like a warehouse. You need space. You need capital. You need dollars. What else do we need? We need raw materials, we need tools, we need space. Distribution. Fine. Distribution. What else do we need? A product. Oh, we need a product. What else do we need? We need a workforce to handle the machines. Say again. A workforce to handle workforce the machines. Labor. Oh. Do all of the people that work in a manufacturing company work on the making side of manufacturing? No. No, probably not. No. So we need labor over here for making. We also need labor over here for sales. Right? Somebody has to do the selling part. Now, is that enough? Do we just need labor for making and labor for selling? I imagine you'll also need some form of management. We also need management. By the way, who usually gets most of the dollars? Probably the management. It's often the management. And it's often the salesperson. And very frequently, those two are couple the management and the salesperson um especially so the salesperson often makes the most money if it's commission sales so every time they make a sale they get a portion of the of the profit to keep for themselves and uh and i have a good friend who runs a fairly large manufacturing company and his top salespeople all make more than he does even though he owns the company and and it's because it's this commission sales thing, um, and there is no such thing as an overpaid commission salesperson. Because, it, it, anyway, that, that's the way it works out often. Uh, because the, the, the guy who owns the company, he pays himself a salary. But the salespeople, their, their potential for earning is unlimited. Um, There's actually a large number of WPI graduates that go into technical sales after they leave here because they discover that. I'm not pointing that, pointing you in that direction yet, uh, but you might think about it as a possible career. So this making, we have labor, we have raw materials, we have tools, we have management, we have a product. So I, I put the product under the selling side, right? And we can add marketing, and we can add facilities management,
to, we've got making, selling, we've got everything else. All right, so if we wanted to start up our, our manufacturing business, we need to have access to raw materials. We need to have access to labor, people that can do stuff. We need to have tools to do the stuff. And so this making over here, this is processing. Material into products. And you can almost, if you, if you were modeling it, for example, you could, you could put that manufacturing process as a black box. There's raw materials that come in, there's energy that comes in, there's labor, the time that comes in, and out comes the, uh, comes the product. And you could model it that way, and, and, and people often do when they're trying to figure out how a big company's gonna work. Now the selling, I said it's only manufacturing if people wanna buy it, right? So the, how do you decide what to make? You're a visionary. <laughs> You're a visionary, yeah. Um, so one of, the, one of the most critical steps in manufacturing is that deciding what to make. All right, so let's, let's focus for a second. And in this class, we're gonna focus on the making part of manufacturing, but we're not gonna forget the selling and the, the everything else parts of manufacturing because most of you, when you leave WPI and you eventually find a job, most of you will end up working for a company that does manufacturing at some level. Most of you will end up working at a manufacturing company and understanding something about the selling side and the everything else parts of it will allow you to potentially work at a company that's not going to fail. And I have worked at companies that succeeded and I have worked at companies that failed. And you can learn a lot when they're failing, but it's not as much fun. And so, uh, so I want you to be able to, to work at companies that are gonna succeed and maybe even help them succeed. All right, so manufacturing is making stuff people want. It, it's made up of making, selling, and everything else. Who works these jobs in making? Let's, let's focus on the making part here. If we've got to turn raw materials into product, that's making. You can do it in a space. You can do it in a manufacturing company. What are the jobs that we do in the making side? <coughs> Who's, is, has anybody in the class ever worked at a manufacturing company and made stuff? Yeah. Yep. Making parts at a warehouse um, at, as a temp job count at all? Sure. <clears throat> I also have. Yeah. Um, all right. So what are the jobs that you have to do in order to do the making part of manufacturing? Um, well, normally there's like, um, for the manufacturing, there was, um, the assembly line people. Um, there was the maintenance people who would, uh, you know, maintenance the tools. Um, to the I'm going to say that the facilities maintenance kind of people, those are part of everything else. They're not making okay. stuff. They're making sure that the equipment exists so that we can make stuff. But okay. We definitely have so the work, and so I don't mean, I don't necessarily mean the job titles, but what are the mm. jobs, what are the actions that have to happen that, that a person has to do, or at least a person could do? Because a lot of these we can automate too. We could have a robot do assembly. Um, well, there is uh, quality control and testing. Quality control. All right, what else? Uh, the design and layout. Design. Um, then usually parts acquisition. To um, acquire. Okay. 
to acquire when to get the raw materials. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Jack's, Jack's been speaking a lot. He's definitely got an A for today's participation grade. Um, I don't know if this will quite count, but I know even if you're running something on the machine, someone needs to operate the machine and obviously yeah. stop if anything goes wrong. I remember in my temp job, um, I was running, it was this, I don't know what it's called, but it's almost like a mill CNC, um, but it wasn't with metal. It was with like those foam bits that you have in like, like it was probably uh, headphones. A yeah, it was, it was probably a CNC mill or it might have been a CNC router, yeah. but that's basically the same thing. Um, but uh, anybody you... else besides besides Jack and... Uh, you'd probably want a technician in case the machine breaks. So, I would call that the setup person. I don't know if this would technically go under making, but um, someone to oversee the efficiency of it. Yeah, I actually, I don't think design belongs there either. We have design. And we have sort of, so the, I think the person you're thinking of is overseeing the efficiency or, or deciding which parts to make on which days and things like that. That's sort of production management. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it down here in the everything else category. But you can't be a profitable manufacturing company without being able to do those things. Um, what else goes into the manufacturing? So we acquire the raw materials. We set up the machine tool. We operate the machine. We do assembly. We do quality control. Is there anything else we have to do in order to be able to manufacture? I have no idea. To be able to, I would say, like after you're done machining that part, you have to have an efficient layout of the workplace to be able to move it to like the next you station. Have you have to design the manufacturing space. Um, design the process. We want to design the process. <coughs> Set up, machine, assemble, quality. The only thing we miss here is package. So that, that, that falls under part of manufacturing is putting it in the box that it's going to get shipped in. Um, but those are the things that we have to do. Uh, where's the engineering? <laughs> Where's the engineering in that? Uh, isn't it in the I design have, process? COVID, if I cough. Would it be in the design process? So there is definitely engineering in the design of the product. There is engineering in the design of the process. Uh, what about product development, R&D? Uh, so that stuff is brought down here. That's not a lot down there and everything else. It's not. So you've got to be able to do it in order to have a good product that the customer is going to buy, that's going to work, but it's not really part of the manufacturing part of, or not really part of the making part. Although you may have to do making in order to do R&D. Quality, quality control? Oh, uh, yeah, we got quality control. I can't spell. So as in uh, parts that require engineering. Say again? Um, you asked for the uh, aspects of manufacturing. Oh, 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 yeah, quality control. The engineering that goes into quality control in the design of the inspection system. So deciding how you're going to, deciding how you're going to check to make sure that you've met the designer's requirements. So that involves engineering. Uh, I got one last topic to cover today, and um, and then my next task is going to be to figure out what the heck's going on with Wednesdays, um, and then to get everything posted for you on the campus site and not just the link for today's lecture. <coughs> um, 
to give any manufacturing is about business. This is about operating a business to make stuff that people want. We know they want it because they pay for it. We can consider value to be how much the customer is willing to pay for the thing that we make. So the value of our product is how much the customer is willing to pay for the thing we make. The cost is how much did those raw materials and the, the production labor and the design of the setup and all those other things that we said was associated with the making. That was how much money did we spend doing all that stuff? That's the cost. What's value minus cost? Profit. And I think value minus cost is profit. I promise you that we're going to do math. What is the first derivative of profit with respect to time? Growth. Income? All right. I promise you we're going to do math because we're engineers, not mathematicians. Profit rate. So let's just take profit divided by time. We can make the increments smaller. We can use L'Hopital's rule to figure out what that first derivative is. But profit over time equals profit. Our goal as a manufacturing company is to always have a positive profit rate. Is that fair? If we have a negative profit rate, what happens? Oops. You go bankrupt. Get out your phone and say, Dad, can I borrow some money? Right, we don't want to have negative profit rates. <laughs> I, Patrick, I, I like your Amazon comment, but every time they want their stock price to go up, they make a profit. Amazon's capable of making a profit. They just don't need to. I don't know why. I don't get the math, but that's how it works. And if you get that big, you can be that way too. Um, just down to the side, most manufacturing companies in the United States are small to medium sized employers, enterprises. The definition of small to medium size means less than 500 employees. Of those, so something like 90% of manufacturing companies in the United States are small to medium companies. Of the small to medium companies, 80% of them have less than 50 employees. Most manufacturing in the United States happens in companies with less than 50 employees. Those companies are often total selling. So their, their total revenue is less than $10 million a year. Most manufacturing happens at companies making less than $10 million a year. And companies that are making less than $10 million a year are struggling to survive all the time. So manufacturing is important, but um, it, it doesn't always get the respect that it needs, although it is the way that we create. So adding value to our raw materials creates new wealth. And, uh, and I'd like you to think about, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pick up either tomorrow or Thursday, depending on how the schedule works. Um, but when we start, I want to talk about that, the idea that wealth is really just potential value. So it's a way of collecting potential value. Um, I thank you all for being here. I hope you got something out of this. I will get everything posted. 64 people, that's pretty high turnout. Professor, I have a quick question. Go for it. So uh, if you're fully remote, what do we do for the labs? Oh yeah, I meant to talk about that at the, the, the point in time when I was talking about the class organization. Um, we will form, I think there's like nine people, at least according to the list I got, there's nine people in the class that are fully remote. 
Uh, we'll do like a when to meet and we'll figure out a time to meet and go through lab stuff outside the, the rest of the, the class. And, uh, and there are kits available that you can order from the bookstore. So if you go to the bookstore, there's a kit that you can buy and they'll ship it to your house. And that has all the stuff that you're gonna need to participate in the at home version of the lab. Um, if you are on campus coming to lab, there's a voucher that you get at the bookstore and that pays for all the materials that we're gonna give you when you arrive in the lab um, so that you can do the lab stuff. So either if you're fully remote, buy the kit. If you're on campus, buy the voucher. Um, another thing that's important to note is that due to, uh, due to COVID, we no longer supply safety glasses for the students who come to the lab. There are safety glasses available at the bookstore. They should cost like $2. If they cost more than $10, go to Amazon and buy some safety glasses and they'll ship them overnight. For, uh, Brian, you get your hand up. How much does the voucher cost again? It's somewhere between 50 and $70. But there is no okay. textbook to buy, so it's roughly the cost of the textbook. But the textbook. Yeah, cool, no textbook. Um, what what is this voucher for again? Is this? It's, uh, it covers the the cost of the materials that you consume during the lab. We used to call it a lab fee, but then um, I don't know. Somebody in accounting got mad. We weren't allowed to have lab fees anymore, but we can still have vouchers. Okay, so it's literally just like an ME1800 voucher or something? Yeah, That's if you go to the bookstore, tell them you're an ME1800. Tell them you're on campus, they should hand you the, they should sell you the voucher. If you, I guess if you're remote, you probably won't go to the bookstore and tell them that you're remote. You'll go to their website and, um, and you should be able to buy the kit being remote. Um, and yeah, next time we meet, whether it's tomorrow or Thursday, we will, uh, uh, pick up on this value and wealth thing, and then we'll talk about the the process of going from that concept to the finished part. We'll define, we'll clearly define the steps that gets us from the the, the concept to the finished part. And the, those steps are the things that we're going to be doing in the lab. By the end of the lab, you should be able to take something that you've designed, make a program for it, run the program on a CNC machine tool and get the part that is the thing that you designed. Um, and you should feel comfortable doing that and welcome to come back and do it at your leisure. Any, any other questions? And please speak up if you have a question because I can't see all the raised hands necessarily. Um, <clears throat> how is that, how are the quizzes in the final exam gonna be handled? Are we looking at- That's one of the reasons I haven't posted the syllabus yet is I'm still deciding. Okay. We're not going to need to download any extensions, are we? Say again? We're not going to need to get any extensions, are we? No. I mean, I could use some, some extensions. If I let my oh, own. no. I meant like browser extensions. Say again? We're not going to need browser extensions, right? Um, there is software that we're going to be using. It run, if you can download it and install it on your own computer, as long as you run a, uh, have a PC. You have a Mac, you're out a lot in there. Game. But you can also run it in an app that WPI supports that, that it just runs inside a web browser. What's its name? So uh, the software we're going to be using is called Esprit. It's by a company called DP Technology. And it'll have, you'll have instructions on Zoom on how to download that, how to install it, how to get access to the licenses. Um, and that's what we're going to be using to do the programming. We're going to use Esprit um, and at the machine tools. We're going to use the machine tools. But no problematic like proctoring software. No. no. Um, I try to make it impossible for students to cheat on the assignments by encouraging the students to work together to solve the problems. If there is no such thing as cheating, then you can't get in trouble for cheating. Um, if you don't do enough of the work, you don't actually learn anything and that usually shows up in the final exam because uh, I don't let you work together on the final exam. And so there is a comprehensive final exam. It's not, it's normally worth about 10% of the grade. So it, it'll change you from an A to a B or something like that if you really bomb the final, but you won't fail the class. Um, 
I want everybody to get an A in the class. I expect everybody to get an A in the class. But what I really want is for you to leave the class having learned something useful for you. All right. Anything else? Because I think we've gone over time. All right. I will see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Probably Thursday.